Cool. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. So, yeah, so this, um, uh, this uh, sequence of lectures is about a topic known as format preserving or format transforming encryption. But that doesn't really say a lot. So I thought maybe a more interesting title was this one, how to make ciphertexts that look like uh, a credit card number or a US street address or a US telephone number or some English language text. Basically how to make a ciphertext that looks like anything you want it to look like. That's really what this series of lectures is about. So, oh yeah, by the way, I'm Tom Shrimpton. Uh, I'm at the University of Florida, part of the Florida Institute for Cybersecurity Research. Okay, so these are two use cases that on the surface appear to have absolutely nothing to do with each other. On top is the problem of how do you encrypt, uh, do an in-place encryption of credit card numbers. So imagine that you have a, uh, a database that uh, you know, your, your major credit card vendor, you have these databases and, uh, and you know, databases have these schemas and they have fields in them. And these fields are meant to hold say 16 decimal digit strings, which are credit card numbers. Um, but in order to be in compliance with, uh, with the law, you actually have to store these things in an encrypted fashion. So the problem is how do you encrypt a credit card number, which is a 16 decimal digit string into a ciphertext that is also a 16 decimal digit string, because you can't just go change the fields in these databases to allow you to say, expand uh, the length of the string you can place there. Or you may have some payment processing chain where the credit card number is actually captured at a point of sale, and then it has to traverse through um, uh, several intermediaries before reaching the issuing bank for the card. And the processing paths through those intermediaries are expecting to see credit card numbers come by, not ciphertext. So this is this is a, a problem. How to do in-place encryption of credit card numbers um, is is one problem, and it's a very important one. It's a, at this point a many billion dollar a year business, uh, but the, but how to do it was a problem that stood open for quite some time. So that's the first thing. The second problem is uh, how do you um, avoid nation state censorship. Uh, in particular, how do you make ciphertext that can pass through deep packet inspection devices that may be looking for things like blacklisted keywords? For example, if you search for uh, free speech democracy, if you do that in the clear, you actually, I don't know if you've ever used like Wireshark or something like this to, to, to do packet capture or packet analysis. You can actually see these keywords. The search terms are actually in the clear. So you want to encrypt them uh, but you want to encrypt them in such a way that the 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 um, the censoring deep packet inspection device doesn't take the fact that the, the the payload that it's observing looks like random bytes and actually uh, use that as a flag to say this uh, this particular packet is suspect. So we have these two problems: how do you encrypt credit card numbers in place, and how do you avoid deep packet? Uh, inspection devices. And these two problems would on the, the face of it seem to have nothing whatsoever to do with each other. It turns out they're actually uh, quite closely related in the sense that traditional encryption is ill-suited for either of these cases. So we're going to start by talking about uh, the top case. And then later today for the second lecture, we'll, we'll get into the, the second case. So in particular, here's an outline of the first part of, of these lectures. On the way to figuring out how we do in-place encryption of credit card numbers, we're going to start with some simpler problems that then build into this. So the first thing we're going to tackle is, let's say I give you an n-bit block cipher, an n-bit PRP, say n is 128 bits if you're using AES, and you'd like to produce from this an n-prime bit PRP. And there are three sort of regimes where um, different solutions apply. The first one, is when you have what I'll call a, a big domain. So in this case, you're trying to turn 128-bit block cipher into say a 125-bit block cipher or a 100-bit block cipher. We'll call this the big domain case. And this is easy and we'll see some simple solutions for this case. The second case is when you're trying to turn 128-bit block cipher into say a 10-bit block cipher. We'll call this the tiny domain case. This too is easy and we'll see some simple solutions for it. 
The hard case is when we're what, what people refer to as the small domain. So here, uh, you you want to turn your 128-bit block cipher into a block cipher whose uh, whose block size is not close to 128 and not close to one. It's somewhere in the middle, like you know, a 40-bit block cipher, 50-bit block cipher, something like that. This is the small domain uh, case, and this this is where things are hard. This is the case that stood open for quite some time. So that's the first chunk that we're going to do. Once we figure that out, then we're going to step back and say, OK, what if I wanted to build uh, a PRP, a block cipher that's still provably a secure PRP, whose native domain is not bit strings, but instead decimal strings? So here we've got this set, the, the, the digits 0 through 9 to the S. So this is a an S digit decimal string. So you can already imagine if you make S equal to 16, now we're talking about credit card numbers, or at least strings that could be credit card numbers. It's not the case that all 16 uh, decimal digit strings are valid credit card numbers. In any case, that's the second uh, big step. And then we'll see that, in fact, the tools that we develop uh, to achieve this much of the talk actually allow us to generalize, to build PRPs that can have arbitrary finite domains. And these domains might be things like credit card numbers or street addresses or valid colorings of graphs, uh, really pretty much anything. So this is the outline of, of what we're going to cover in this first lecture today. And by the way, I have no idea how long uh, the, these, these uh, slides are. I haven't actually run through them yet. So I think there's a lot here, but I don't know exactly how much we'll get to before we have the break. Um, but we'll, we'll see how it goes. By the way, please do feel free to ask questions. It's a little difficult for me to see when questions, when somebody has a question, because you guys are a tiny little uh, collection of people on the side of my screen. But hopefully, yeah, maybe John Paul or somebody can help uh, me sort out if, if folks have questions. But do feel free to ask. I will let you know, yes, there's questions. OK, yeah, I, actually, I just heard there's like a delay. So <clears throat> all right, well, let's get on with it then. So um, just to make sure everybody's on the same page, I imagine everyone here knows what a block cipher is. Let's just make sure we're all on the same page, at least notationally. So the traditional block cipher syntax is you have a two input function. Um, the first input uh, is k bits long, and this is the key. And the second input is the actual data block. And we talked about like an n-bit block cipher, and that means it takes in an n-bit string and it outputs an n-bit string. And what makes a block cipher a block cipher is, is the, uh, the, the structural property that for every key, the mapping, once you fix the key, the mapping is a bijection. Yeah, you get, you get a bijection uh, over, over strings of like that. This is, this is the traditional block cipher syntax. A more common way to actually view this is to think of it as a function family. So for each key, you have a mapping from n bits to n bits. And you think of this as a set, as a family that's indexed by the key. And again, with this property that you have a bijection, every one of these n bit to n bit mappings is a permutation. And the standard PRP or, or SPRP, strong PRP security notions, effectively say, um, well, OK, so I don't, can you see my uh, little arrow here with the mouse circling? Yes, yes. Good, thank you. So, of course, you know, um, the, the standard PRP notion is you have two possible Oracle settings. One is that a key has been picked uniformly at random, which is the same as, say, picking one permutation out of this set here, each key naming a permutation. By the way, this big blue circle here, this is the set of all permutations over n bit strings. So all the possible permutations that could be named by the block cipher are contained in this, this black subset here. And that's one possible Oracle world. The other one is that you sample uniformly from the entire blue set. Of course, this is not to scale, because if you had a 128-bit permutation, then there are two to the 128 factorial possible permutations that are in this blue dot. And at most, two to the 128 inside of this here. But nonetheless, this is the you know, the basic PRP notion is that uh, no efficient test can distinguish between having sampled from the entire blue set versus having sampled from the, the, the designated subset here. OK, so that's just the basics. Make sure we're all on the same page. Now let's get to the first problem on the way to figuring out how to encrypt credit card numbers. OK, so the first thing is, let's say we want to turn an n bit block cipher into an n minus one bit block cipher. So 
the, the obvious idea here is let's truncate, right? If I have a 128 bit block cipher and I want to make 127 bit block cipher, we just truncate, right? So here's the first idea. Let's, let's uh, define our block cipher to have a key K and take an input X and we'll define its output to be the N minus one least significant bits of the N bit block cipher running on input X. It's the first idea and it's the obvious one. But of course, it's also obviously wrong. I mean, even syntactically, it's wrong. Can you see why? Uh, X here is 128 bits and you need 127 bits, right? <laughs> exactly. Thank you. Exactly. Right. This can't work because you have 128 uh, bit input and you really want 127 bit input. So we'll fix that. What we'll say instead is that um, if you hand me your string X, which is 127 bits, I'll just prepend a zero bit to the top. And now I can run this through my, my, uh, my n bit block cipher. So then the question is, okay, well, how do we actually invert this? So I, I get this n minus one bit output. How do I invert it? Here's a sort of a straw man way to do it. Okay, so uh, my, my output is, is y. So my 127 uh, bit string is y. I'll prepend a zero to it, and then I'll run it backwards to the block cipher. And if what I see is a string that starts with a zero bit, then I'll return the remainder and, 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 uh, and call that done. Otherwise, if that doesn't work, then what I'll do is instead take this 127 bit string y, and I'll prepend a one to it, and I'll invert that. And if that starts with a zero, then I'll, I'll return that resulting X. Well, of course, this isn't gonna work, right? And let's see a concrete example of why not. So at the top here, we've just got our, our, our construction again. And here's a simple example for the case of n equals two. So here is a, uh, is a permutation. This is you know, saying E sub K for, for one particular key has this mapping to it. Uh, zero is mapped to zero one, zero one maps to one one and so on. Okay, well, so if you take our, our uh, candidate construction and you say, well, what would be the result of enciphering single bit zero? Well, this would be the least significant bit of zero with a zero put in the front. And that mapping tells us that we take the least significant bit of this, which is one. Likewise, when you try to encipher the single bit one, then you're gonna put a zero in front of that and then run that through your two-bit block cipher and take the least significant bit, which is again one. So this doesn't work. Okay, no surprise. Let's see a technique that does work. <clears throat> so here we're gonna turn an n-bit block cipher into an n minus m-bit block cipher, where m is any value between one and, and, and minus one, I suppose. So we'll start, same basic idea. We'll take our, our, our n minus m-bit string x and we'll prepend to it m zero bits so now you have an n bit string and we'll run it through the n bit block cipher and we'll check does the the upper m bits of the output is are, are those all zeros if they <clears throat> excuse me if they are then we'll stop and we'll output y if not we'll take the string that we got and we'll run it through the block cipher again and we'll ask the same question are the m most significant bits all zeros if they are we'll return y if not we continue and so on. Now, if we look at what this is doing, you probably know. So of course, for every key K, the block cipher is a permutation. And you probably know that you can take any permutation and you can decompose it into a collection of disjoint cycles. What we're doing here is we're cycle walking. This is called the cycle walking cipher. So if we think of, of, of this first input string as Z0, that's a particular point on some cycle for this permutation. By applying the block cipher once, we move to the next point on the cycle, Z1. By applying it again, we then move to Z2 and so on. So we're walking around a cycle. The question is, can we have something like this? The answer is no, we can't have something like this. You actually have to have a cycle. You can't have sort of weird uh, upside down row shape. You can't have this because if you did, that would mean you'd have two points, Z2 and Z0, that both map to Z1. In that case, you wouldn't have a permutation. So we can't have this for sure. So we know that um, at some point, this process of cycle walking, this process of, cypher, of, of ciphering using cycle walking will terminate, right? The, in the absolute worst case, every point is on one big cycle. Uh, so 
we know that that minimally, of course, if every point was on one cycle, then then you'd run into one of these strings that starts with all zeros sooner than having to walk the entire cycle. But in the absolute worst case, you'll end up walking back to the point you started with. Right? You know there is some point on this cycle that starts with with the the requisite number of zero bits. So this will terminate. You will actually get to output something. Uh, Actually, maybe I should ask this. Is it clear that you can uh, properly invert this process? I mean, we're just applying a permutation repeatedly, and you know that the composition of permutations is itself a permutation. So that's one answer for yes, you should be able to invert it. But you could also see why this works. We stopped walking around the cycle. We stopped running this process. When we hit the first string, say it was Z2, that started with M zero bits, right? Well, that means then we know that if we receive uh, this n minus m bit string as the output, that if we prepend zero bits to it and go backwards, the first time we hit a string that starts with all zeros, that had to be the one we started with, right? because otherwise we would have stopped sooner. So we know that this, this is a proper cipher, and it's a cipher on n minus m bits for any value of m that you like. But it's not going to be efficient for any value of m that you like. And in particular, if you think about replacing this block cipher with a random permutation, right, so maybe it's easier to think about it as, as, as a random function, then, well, the first time you call it with this first string, the probability that these bits here are going to be all zeros is, is 1 over 2 to the m, right? So we're flipping basically a, a heavily biased coin. And that means we expect to have to take about two to the M steps, two to the M applications of the block cipher before we hit a string that we can actually output, right? It's it's not exactly two to the M because after all, this is a permutation. So if you don't hit a string with all zeros here, uh, because of permittivity, you know there's a slightly better chance that the next time you will hit one, but you can pretend as if it's, if it's uh, two to the M is the expected number of steps you're going to have to take. So if you actually were to try to do the reduction to show that you still have a good PRP, given that you started with a good PRP, um, if you think about how that reduction would go, what are you going to do? So you're going to, um, anytime that you, you are handed a query, you're just going to call your Oracle repeatedly until you get something that starts with all zeros. You're basically just going to run this by making Oracle calls uh, as, as required. Well, so that's going to blow up both the number of queries that you need to make in the reduction, but also the running time of the reduction. So it's clear um, if, if you assume that you have to make exactly two to the M calls for every every one point that you need to encipher, then if there are Q queries being made to the cycle walking cipher, that means you're going to make Q times two to the M queries to your, your big uh, uh, N bit oracle. So it's clear that this is only going to be efficient and, and actually give you a reasonably tight um, uh, bound on the PRP advantage when when M is small, right? When you're when you're turning, for example, if you were just trying to reduce by one bit, so you went from a 128 to 127 bit cipher, then you'd expect to have to do two invocations of, of the, the M bit block cipher each time you needed to run this. So when M is small, in other words, when N minus M, the effective domain you're trying to build, is essentially N, then this is a very useful method. It's efficient and it, it has a nice tight reduction. Is that is that clear to everyone? Yes. I'm gonna I'm gonna assume that the answer. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I know it's, I know it's clear to you, John Paul. <laughs> Can I ask All a question? Right, so actually, let's look at the other. Yeah. Sure. Go ahead. Um, so, is the cipher fully defined with good probability, or it's undefined but you don't care because you're never gonna hit the points where it's undefined? So I guess there is no, a chance it's, that it's fully, it's fully defined. So there's the chance of finding a, a short cycle which never has hits zero. The probability is also very small. Which you, you're, you're guaranteed to always hit a point that, that starts with zero, in particular because you started with a point that's, that started with all zeros. Oh, OK. So even if you're on a short cycle that contains no other point that starts with all zeros, you know that there's at least one on there, namely the one that you started with. So in the worst case, you'll walk back to that. All right, thanks. Cool. All right, so let's look at the other end. So um, if we, we've got a solution for that's efficient and has a nice tight uh, reduction for the case that you're just trying to shrink the domain of your block cipher a little bit. But what if you want to shrink it a lot? Like 
let's pretend here you want to turn your 128-bit block cipher into a 3-bit block cipher. I don't know why you want to do this, but let's say that you did. So here's what we're going to do in this case. Um, we're going to encipher the entire 3-bit domain. So this is like pre-computation. You've, you've keyed AES, and now we're going to pre-compute the table for our 3-bit block cipher in the following way. We're going to take all of the eight possible input values, which here numerically I'm denoting as 0 through 7, and I'm going to encode them. So this notation angle brackets with a subscript of n means to encode the number here as an n-bit string, which is what you need as input because this is an n-bit block cipher. So we're going to take all eight possible inputs, and we're going to run them through the block cipher, and we're going to get these outputs, y0, y1, through y7. That's the first step. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to sort these values. It doesn't really matter how you sort them, but we're going to sort them, let's say, lexicographically. We know that there is always a, a total ordering of these strings because this is a permutation. So we're never going to see the same value twice. So we know that we actually can order these things uh, in, for example, uh, this example here, the, the output Y2. So the result of enciphering 2 uh, was the smallest value. And then the result of enciphering 7 was the next smallest value and so on. So we've done uh, eight block cipher calls, and then we've sorted that list. So this is all quite efficient so far. And then the way we're actually going to define our three-bit cipher is by what I'll call an index to position mapping. So in particular, the index of what appears at position zero in the ordering, if we start our ordering from zero, is two. So our mapping is going to be that two maps to zero seven maps to one and so on. So this is how we define our three bit cipher that now if you take the two encoded as a three bit string, we're gonna define that that uh, input is gonna give you the output of zero encoded as a three bit string because two appears in the zeroth position. Seven as a three bit string is going to return the value of one and so on. This is how we are gonna define this cipher. This is called the prefix cipher not entirely sure why it's called a prefix cipher, to be honest, but that's what it's called. And it has um, really the best possible security you could hope for. So here's our example again. Um, and we can ask ourselves the question for this ordering, which was the, the ordering that we have in this example, we started with a good PRP. So, oh, I don't know if we saw this. We started with, with this keyed block cipher. And if it's a good PRP, that means we can effectively replace it with a random permutation pi, sampled from the entire space of all n-bit permutations. And so we can ask ourselves the question, if I were to sample pi from the set of all permutations uniformly, what is the probability of the event that you get this ordering? In particular, that when you encipher two, that ends up being less than the enciphering of seven, that being less than the enciphering of five, and so on. Well, this is a pretty simple combinatorial argument. I have eight elements in here, and my requirement is that they go in a particular order. In particular, the two has to appear. If you think about your permutation as a, as a table, then uh, wherever two appears, it has to appear. The, yeah, so the, 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 um, the enciphering of two has to be higher in the list, higher in the table than the enciphering of seven, which has to be higher than the enciphering of five, and so on. So there's a particular order you have to assert, and there are eight possible, um, there are eight things we need, to, we basically need to pick eight rows, right? So out of all the two to the n possible values that could be output by this n-bit permutation, we choose eight of them, any eight you like, and we, we put them in, in, in the order that we require as defined by this event. The remaining two to the n minus eight possible points. We can put those into our table in any order we like. So that gives us a uh, two to the n minus eight factorial. So those are all of the permutations that would satisfy this restriction here. But of course, since we're sampling uniformly, that means we're going to divide that number by two to the n factorial because that's the number of permutations you could sample. Well, if you do the cancellations here, uh, well, so we first, if you expand this, and then do the cancellations, what you get in the end is that the probability of sampling an n-bit permutation and having this restriction on the ordering is one over eight factorial. Well, what we're actually trying to build here is a three-bit PRP. So we can ask ourselves the same question. If we were to sample a three-bit permutation uniformly and then ask what's the probability of the same event 
happening. Of course, there are eight factorial permutations over three bits, and it, precisely one of them has the table filled in with this ordering. So the probability, if you picked a three-bit permutation of seeing this happen, is one over eight factorial, which is precisely the same as this. So doing this prefix cipher, if you started from an n-bit random permutation, gives you precisely the same probability as if you had a three-bit random permutation. So you inherit entirely the binding between the PRP security of the n-bit block cipher and the PRP security of the three-bit cipher that you build is tight. It's, it's precisely the same. So to recap that, we have, we have these two settings we consider, the tiny domain case, where you have this thing called a prefix cipher, and this gives you a very tight uh, reduction, but it's clear that this is only going to be useful when your domain is tiny, right? Because you do this pre-computation where, uh, you know, if you were saying, okay, I'm gonna use my prefix cipher to build a, a you know, a 40-bit cipher, well, you have to do two to the 40 block cipher calls to compute the table, and then you have to store that. So this is only gonna be efficient when indeed you're making a block cipher whose domain is very, very small relative to the one you started with. On the other hand, if you have uh, uh, trying to build a block cipher whose domain is very close to the, the size of the block cipher that you started from, then we can use the cycle walking cipher. So we've sort of covered these two ends of the spectrum. And the question remains, well, what do we do for these smallish domains? So in particular, here's a very important small domain problem. This is the credit card and cipher problem. So <clears throat> I said uh, at the outset that it's not the case that all 16 uh, digit, decimal digit strings are in fact valid credit card numbers. And we'll talk a bit more about, about that later. But just for the sake of argument, say that they, that they were. Um, well, you have a block cipher. Block ciphers work natively on bit strings. So if you were to take uh, all of the possible, all the 10 to the 16 possible decimal digit strings here, take log two of that to get the number of bits you need, it's somewhere between uh, 53 and 54 bits you require. So you have to round up to 54 so you can accommodate them all. So then that says, okay, then if I started from AES, which is 128 bits, I need to build a 54 bit block cipher. I don't know about you, but I don't know of any 54 bit block ciphers that I can pull off the shelf. So what you do is you have these, so far, these two options. One is you can build a prefix cipher, which would require two to the 54 storage and pre-computation. That's a non-starter, uh, particularly on you know small devices. Alternatively, you could use a cycle walking cipher, in which case uh, you'll need, what is that? 128 minus 54, yeah. So you'll need two to the 74 steps to do a single enciphering. And you're clearly not gonna do that either. We need something, something new, something smarter here. One fairly obvious idea, and in fact, this is uh, roughly how um, some of these uh, schemes are actually built, is to is to do feist, right? When we're building block ciphers, doing feist is an obvious thing to try. So we could build what I'll call small domain balanced feist. So here, um, if you let s be ten to the sixteen, so that's the the, the number of sixteen decimal digit uh, strings. I said uh, on the previous slide that that if you take log two of that number, you get a number that's between 53 and 54 bits. So what we're doing here is we're building a uh, we're building a PRP um, on the the range from zero up to s minus one. If you think of of uh, of all these decimal digit strings as being actual numbers now, and we've picked a value of t such that. Uh, the, the total number of inputs that we ever want to encipher is between two to the T minus one and two to the T, right? In this case, T is 54. So you take your number and you can code it as a T bit string and you can run Feistel over it. And then if if the, uh, so this is one round of balanced Feistel here, whoops, sorry, uh, one round of balanced Feistel. And so, you know, you need an even number, you need T to be an even number, which in this case it happens to be, but if, if this were instead 55, then you'd actually have to round up to 56 to get something even so you could split it in half. So here's one round of balanced Faisal. You guys all know what this looks like. Uh, if you were to run uh, your Faisal cipher, so you have you know, some number of rounds of this, you may actually get a point here that's not in the range when interpreted as a number not not falling in this range from zero up to s minus one in particular because we had to upper bound we had to, to increase the size of the domain in order to accommodate everything 
So what do you do if you end up at the end with a string that's not uh, as a number between zero and S minus one? You cycle walk, right? And you know you're not gonna have to walk very far because of this relationship here. You basically picked a value of T that was like just, just big enough to, to accommodate what you need. Uh, so if S happens to be even, then I guess you'd have to walk uh, expected two steps um, you know, if, like if S was was very close to two to the T minus one, but you're actually using T bits, you might have to do it twice. If you if S was not even, then you might have to do it, I guess, up to four times uh, in order to do it. But in any case, you could use cycle walking to, to do this. How would you actually implement this thing? Well, if you have you're starting with AES, so that's going to become your Feistel uh, round function. So you might define, for example, that uh, this round function here is you take AES with the key that you have for the round function. Uh, you prepend uh, uh, a sufficient number of zero bits to the value that you need. So this value on this wire here. And then you take the least significant T over two bits of that, and that's the output of your round function. So this is a fairly straightforward way to handle the small domain problem. Yay, that's great. We've, we've solved it. Except we haven't, because the classic result for uh, three round Feistel is, well, the classic result is that three rounds of this would suffice to give you a PRP, four rounds would suffice to give you an SPRP. But the security bound that you get is only uh, security up to two to the T over four queries in this case, right? It's basically birthday in half the size. So if you have 54 bits, if T is 54, then this says you get security up to about two to the 13 or two to the 14 queries. And that's that's not real security, right? You can't actually do better than that. So there's a, a really nice result by Maurer and Pietrzek uh, that says if you have R rounds, then you get SPRP security up to about two to the T over two minus one over R. So in this case, this is roughly two to the 27 minus one over R, where R is the number of rounds. So you know if you let R uh, grow significantly, so the one over R goes to zero, you're getting basically two to the one, or sorry, two to the 27 query security. That's still not enough for, for real applications. Um, Petran had a, a result that said if you have six rounds, that's already enough to give you uh, basically um, birthday. But again, that's still just two to the 27. So while we have a construction that works in this, in this regime, we don't have any that actually give us security that you want. Because really, if you have only like a 54-bit cipher, you want security up to something like two to the 54 queries, right? And, and e even more pointedly, as your domain shrinks, if you're making, say, a 30-bit block cipher, you really are going to want security up to something like two to the 30 queries, not two to the uh, whatever 30 over four is, right? You're not going to want that. So it's, it's really, this, this is really what, what made this problem stay open for, for so long, was trying to figure out how do I get you know, the security levels to be where I need them to be for such a small domain. All right, <clears throat> so for that, we're gonna do something completely different. Now, we're gonna at least look at it in a completely different way. Um, this is one round of maximally unbalanced Feistel. So before we had balanced or we split, we split our, our string in half, here, we're gonna have just one bit on the left and all the remaining bits are on the right. So these m minus one bits go through our, our round function, which is going to map m minus one bits to one bit. Then we XOR, and we're going to place that on the right now, which is now the least significant bit. And everything else just gets copied. Now this is one round of maximally unbalanced Feistel. So once you consider the two input strings that differ only in their most significant bits, so zero followed by all zeros and one followed by all zeros, say. Well, clearly, because in both of these cases, you have the same input going into the round function, you're getting the same bit D in either case. We're just copying the entire yellow portion on the left. That's just the unbalanced Feistel construction. So the only difference between the outputs of the single round is whether or not you get D or D complement. Okay. Now I want you to think about a small deck of cars. So here, let's say the n's equal to three, just to make it uh, easy to put on the screen. So we have eight cards, number zero through seven, and we'll say that they start out in positions that are enumerated by the three bit strings. So 
card zero appears at the all zeros position initially, card one appears at position zero, zero, one initially, and so on. So the, the strings up here are the position in the deck of cards, and these are the actual cards that appear at those positions. So the enciphering using maximally unbalanced Feistel of these two strings here, you can think of as the enciphering of the position of these sort of partnered cards, the card that appears at the all zeros position and the card that appears at position one zero zero. But was there a question? I heard some crackling on the microphone. No, no okay. I don't think so. Um, okay, so you can think of this enciphering as kind of enciphering the positions of these cards. So if the value of D, the bit that comes out of the round function when putting an N minus one, uh, in this case, a two bit string of all zeros in, if the value of that is zero, then the, the card at position all zeros, zero remains there, right? If, if this is the position of the zero card and D is zero, then you get the same position out. And the partner card, the one that appears at position one zero zero, it's now going to appear at position all zeros with a one at the end. So it goes here. So if the bit D is zero, you get the ordering zero four. In other words, the two cards um, that were at these partner positions, they stay in the same relative order. If instead the bit D was equal to one, then the relative order gets switched because now what happens, this bit here becomes a one which puts the zero card now in this position. And this bit here is a zero, which means the four now goes to this position. So if D is equal to one, the relative ordering of these two partnered cards gets swapped. You guys follow me? So then if I repeat this process now, for every X in the possible end bit strings, well, okay, so I started in this first position, I had ciphered those, and I just continue now through all the possible n minus one bit strings. Um, I'm looking now at pairs, partnered cards, uh, partnered positions that, that differ only in their most significant bits. So again, now you take the string X, you run it through your round function. This basically flips a, a bit and determines whether or not the cards of our position 001 and 101 stay in the same order or get swapped and so on. You do this for each pair of partnered cards. What we've done here basically is shuffle this deck of cards. Maximally unbalanced Feistel has given us a particular, particular shuffling of this small deck of cards. In particular, this is a shuffle called the Thorpe Shuffle. So what Thorpe Shuffle, if you actually were to see it out of this context, is you take a deck of cards, you cut it in half, and then you flip a coin. And if the coin comes up heads, or in this case, that's called at zero, you drop the bottom card from the left deck first, and then you drop the bottom card from the right deck. And then you flip another coin. And again, you decide if the, that comes up heads, then you drop the left and then the right. If it comes up tails, you drop the right and then the left. So this is the Thorpe Shuffle, is dropping one card at a time based on a coin flip. Well, that's, that's precisely what it is this maximally unbalanced Feistel is doing. The coin flip is the output of the round function. Whoops. The coin flip is the output of the round function. And whether or not you drop the bottom card from the left half of the deck first, or you drop the bottom card from the right half of the deck first is determined by the value of this coin flip. So let's look at the path followed by say the zero card. So I've made that here in magenta, started out in the all zero position. Its partner is the one that appears at the one zero zero position. In that case, that's the card number four. And let's say that running, uh, I've gone ahead and replaced the round function now with a truly random function row one for round one. Let's say that when I, when I run uh, the two bit zero string through this, I get D one equal to one. Well, then that tells us we're going to swap the relative ordering of these two cards. So zero appears here now. So this is the, this, this should be four, but this, these positions, these are the card in round one that appears at the all zeros position, the card in round one that appears at this position and so on. Okay, so we, we flipped this one coin and it told us we should swap the relative ordering of these two. Okay, what if we look at the next round? Well, if the next round, now what goes in? Now the string that goes in is, you know, it's all zeros with whatever D1 was now at the end. So we've run that through our 
independent second round uh, random round function, we get some bit D2. And again, the partners now are zero and this card. And if the bit is zero, then, uh, oh, did I, did I yeah, this, they should have stayed in the same order. Sorry, they shouldn't have been uh, swapped. Anyway, the point is uh, that you can trace the position of card zero where it's going to end up in, in the, the final shuffling of this deck. In order to do that, you don't have to care about what bits were flipped for any other cards. All you care about is where zero started and what were the possible, what were the, the, the coin flips along the way? You don't have to attend to the position of any other cards. You just need to know the coin flips for zero. And that's nice because this gives us a property what's called, uh, it's an oblivious shuffle. Meaning that, um, as I said, the, the position of any particular card as a result of shuffling doesn't depend on the positions of other cards. It depends only on the coin flips associated to that card. This is different from say, uh, uh, the riffle shuffle. So this is the one you typically do. You cut the deck in half and you brrrr, and you bridge them. And they, you know, there, if you wanted to find the position of any particular card, you also have to know something about the positions of other cards in the deck. That's not an oblivious shuffle. And um, oblivious shuffles are nice because oblivious shuffles lend themselves to becoming block ciphers. Because in particular, if you want to encipher a string of all zeros, you don't want to have to encipher all the other inputs in order to figure out what the output is going to be for the string of all zeros. You just want to encipher zeros, right? Well, if you have an oblivious shuffle that says that you don't actually have to care about the other inputs, it's only that input that matters. So oblivious shuffles make nice block ciphers. There's a nice mapping between them. Shuffles that are not oblivious, they don't. This was something that was first observed actually by Moni Nauer I think back in the 90s at some point. <clears throat> in any case, so we've got this nice, uh, really interesting coupling now between um, maximally unbalanced Feistel, which is something that we cryptographers are used to thinking about, and a way to shuffle a deck of cards. And I have to say, just like, it's kind of a side note. Uh, so Phil Rogaway was my advisor. And you know how it's like when you're a kid and you're growing up, particularly if, if you're a boy, at some point, you kind of reach for the point, some of your teenage years where you feel like, you know what, if my dad and I got in a fight, I'm pretty sure I could take it now. He's getting a little older. I'm getting a little, you know, faster, a bit more muscular. I'm pretty sure I could take it now. I remember sitting in the audience watching Phil give this talk. And I was probably, I don't know, five or six years into my career at that point, you know, starting to feel pretty good about myself as a professor, feeling like I had some reasonable publications, whatever. And I remember sitting there watching Phil give this talk and thinking to myself, nope, I still can't take my dad. <laughs> because this observation to me was so, like, like how, how did he see this? This, this, this bizarre connection between Feistel networks and shuffles. And moreover, the fact that seeing this connection was going to allow us to roll in all of these results about shuffling that let us then translate those shuffling results into results about the security of a block cipher. That to me was just like, dude, this guy is brilliant and he's still so much better than me. <laughs> anyway, so you know that for um, unbalanced, maximally unbalanced Faisal, we have an n bit maximally unbalanced Faisal, then after n rounds of that, you will effectively have randomized every, every bit of the initial input string. So we're going to call that one pass. So in this case, when n is equal to three, after three rounds, you will have made one complete pass over the initial position of card zero. The question is, how many passes do we need to get really strong PRP security guarantees? Because remember what we're after here are security guarantees that say you are indistinguishable from a random permutation, even against adversaries that can make uh, a number of queries. That's like almost the entire domain, right? We, we need this because we're going to be dealing with domains that are small. So this is the next question to ask is, how many passes do we need to get these really strong security guarantees? And this is really where the, the, the brilliant uh, uh, bit of, of realizing that block ciphers and shuffles have this have this uh, this relationship is that you can roll in all these results about shuffle. So shuffles are analyzed um, 
using Markov chain. So um, just to, to make sure we're all on the same page about Markov chain. So if you fix a finite set S, uh, for the case of shufflings, you can think about the state space, the set S, is the all the possible shufflings of a deck. So all permutations of, of some finite set. And we're going to let the sequence of random variables, x0, x1 through xt, and so on, the sequence of random variables are going to take on values. So you can think of these random variables as taking on some permutation, some shuffling of a deck. And this sequence of random values is a Markov chain if it has this Markovian property, which is that if you know the entire sequence of states uh, that these random variables took on prior to the one that you care about right now, the probability that you end up at time t or, or step t in the sequence in any particular state st actually depends only on where you were just one step ago. Right? This is the Markovian uh, 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 property, sorry. Uh, so you can read this, this is the probability of being in state st at time t, given that you were in state s t minus one at time t minus one. We refer to these as the transition probabilities. And it's convenient to think of these tran transition probabilities in matrix form. This may in fact be the way the, uh, you most often see Markov change in textbooks is, is in this kind of matrix form. You have a matrix of transition probabilities that's of size, uh, has the same number of rows as columns, and that number is the size of the state space. And <clears throat> the, the, the row in this matrix is labeled by x, um, well, actually, if you step back, the position in this, which is row X column Y, is the probability that given that you are at state X, you transition to state Y. So again, PXY is the probability that if I'm in state X, in one step, I transition to state Y. This is the matrix P, the transition matrix. And what you notice is that every row, so if you fix a particular X, that says, uh, okay, at time t minus one, I'm at some state, excuse me. If I were to look at all possible states I could go to from X, well, you have to go someplace, right? So in particular, that means that every row in this matrix is a self distribution, right? From where you are, you have to make some move with, with probability one, if you consider all possible moves from that state, you have to go someplace, even if going someplace means staying put, right? You have to make some move. So every row in this matrix is going to be itself a distribution. All right, my guess is probably many of you have, have seen this before, but I thought it'd be useful to at least put us on the same page. <clears throat> so let's look some, at some properties of this. So in particular, let's look at, um, let's just say that you, your state space is whatever it is, but we can always enumerate it since it's finite. So let's say that we've just enumerated it and we're treating the state space as if it's the numbers one up through N. And your initial random variable x0, the, the first random variable in this uh, in this Markov chain, is distributed according to some initial uh, probability distribution, which is just the probability that your initial state was one, your initial state was two, and so on up through your initial state being n. If you take your, your transition matrix and you hit it on the left by this row vector, well, that's gonna be, you know, this thing is a row times the first column of this transition matrix. That's what's gonna go in the first position of this product. What's gonna go in the second position is the row vector, that's the initial distribution times the second column and so on, right? Well, if you expand out what this first one is, this is just, it's just total probability, right? You're saying, um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm reading like across the, the, the row uh, in this vector well, that's just the probabilities that X0 takes on any particular value V. So we're summing through all the values V times, well, what appears in the first column is the probability that you transition to state one from whatever V is. But that's just total probability. And in fact, this sum just gives you the probability that X1 happens to be one. So this product here, is going to give us in the first position, the probability that X1 is equal to one. And if you repeated this now for the next position, you just replace every barrel one by two, and you end up with the probability that X1 is equal to two and so on. So what you get is another distribution. It's the distribution of where you land in that first step. Oop, there we go. Too far, there we go, sorry. Well, okay, so we can ask the same question then. If I now replace the initial distribution x uh, pi zero with pi one, I run the same thing. 
clearly this is going to now give us a distribution of where you end up with on the second step. But you also notice that the same product I could rewrite because pi one is just pi zero times p. I can replace that here. And what I end up with is pi zero times p squared. So that means that the, the distribution of states in the second step is can be computed by saying, take the distribution I started with and hit it with the square of our transition probability matrix. And if you continue in this way, the distribution at the teeth time step in your sequence is just your initial distribution times P raised to the T. In particular, you can think of P to the T at position X, Y as being the probability that you end up in state Y at time T, given that you started at time zero in state X. I'm just curious if I can see this. Hands up if, you, if this is all familiar. A few people. Good. Okay. Well, then I'm, hopefully I'm not completely boring everybody in the audience. Then. Fine. So this is uh, this is what I wanted to say about just kind of basic Markov chain setup. But the the the, the key takeaway here is that if you have this this transition uh, probability matrix and you raise it to repeated powers, what you're effectively getting is what is the probability that if I start someplace, I end up uh, at any particular place t steps later. Okay. So. A distribution for Markov chain is called stationary if my distribution nu, if I hit, hit the transition probability matrix P on the left by it, I get the same, the same distribution back, right? In other words, the transition probabilities don't do anything. It doesn't change the distribution from, from step to step. So in particular, this means that if, if you start, if your initial distribution is the stationary distribution, then you remain in the stationary distribution at every point in time. So for example, if the stationary distribution, uh, if a stationary distribution for your chain was the uniform distribution, then if you start by picking a state uniformly at random, then forevermore as you transition, you will be at a uniformly random state for all time. Well, there's no guarantee that in fact, every Markov chain has a stationary distribution, but if you have certain properties, then you do. So in particular, if your Markov chain is finite, so we have a, means you have a finite number of states, irreducible and aperiodic. Well, let me try to explain what these mean quickly then. Irreducible means that for any pair of states, X and Y, if you start at X, you can ultimately reach Y with some non-zero probability. In other words, it's not the case that you can't ever get from X to Y. If for every pair of states, you can, at some, there's some non-zero probability you can't actually get between them, then you have an irreducible Markov chain. Aperiodic means that <clears throat> you never have something like, if I start at X uh, and I wanna know what's the probability that I, that I remain at X in one step, that that probability is zero, so I have to move. But then in two steps, there is some probability that I could be back. But in three steps, I can't. But in four steps, I could. Then what I basically have is a period, a period of, of two, of whether or not I can actually return to the state where I started. If you never have something like this, so in particular, if you take all possible paths from X back to itself, you take their lengths and you take the GCD of those lengths and you get one, then you have an aperiodic chain. So if you have a finite irreducible aperiodic chain, then a couple of important things happen. The first is that P to the T in the limit, it exists, you actually do converge to something ultimately. We'll call that matrix Q. Importantly, every row in this matrix Q is the same distribution pi for some distribution. So what you get is constant rows, which of course means you also get constant columns. And in particular, this pi is the unique stationary distribution for this chain. So there is not only a stationary distribution, but there's exactly one. And you do converge to with a sufficient number of steps. <clears throat> okay, so let's now pop back up. Let's look at shuffles as a Markov chain. So there's obviously there's a natural way to think of a shuffle as being a Markov chain. And in particular, if you think of the state space um, as being the possible orderings of cards, then um, here I'm showing that you've got this at time t, this is your ordering of cards. And if your coin flips, when you are considering now pairing up 
you know, the all zero string with the one zero zero string and so on. When you look at these at these partnerings and you consider the possible bits, so let's say that the bits um, that resulted uh, from running uh, these two bit strings through the, the bit flip gave you zero zero one, then this is the ordering of cards you'd end up with. In particular, uh, five and four remain in the same relative order because zero was the bit that was flipped there. Um, one and two remain in the same relative order and so on. The only ones that change are six and zero. Their relative order gets swapped. So you could move in one step from this state to this state for these coin flips. If you had a different set of coin flips, you would move from this state to this state. So if you compute up here, I've got four coin flips that I have to make to move from one state to another. And each of those has two possible outcomes. So there are 16 possible um, orderings of the deck you can go to in one step. More generally, if you have uh, uh, two to the n, so here we're doing n equals three, but if n is larger, for any state xt, for any ordering of the cards right now, there are two to the two to the n minus one possible places to go next. Each one of them occurs with the same probability. So you've got kind of uniform probability of going to any of these possible next steps. It turns out there are also the same number of ways to get into any particular state. And so as a result, what you get is a matrix P that is not just a distribution across each row, it's also a distribution down each column. This kind of a matrix is called doubly stochastic, when all the rows sum to one and all the columns sum to one. You have a doubly stochastic matrix. And when you have a doubly stochastic matrix, you can show that the stationary distribution for this Markov chain is the uniform distribution, which means in particular that if you run this Thorpe shuffle for a sufficient number of rounds, you will ultimately converge on a uniformly shuffled deck of cards. Well, that's cool because we've established that there's this relationship between maximally unbalanced Feistel and one round of Thorpe shuffle. So in particular, one round of maximum bonds Feistel on the string B concat X is the same as one round of Thorpe shuffle on the cards that are at positions B uh, and B complement with X, right? And we know that Thorpe shuffle, um, after a sufficient number of rounds of it, will give you a uniform permutation on the cards, which means then that a sufficient number of rounds of maximally unbalanced Feistel with independent round functions will result in a uniform permutation being applied to this input string. Well, ta-da! You can use these results about Thorpe shuffles to tell you precisely how many rounds of maximally unbalanced fight you need to get not only something that looks like it's a uniform random permutation, that actually is a uniform random permutation. That's pretty amazing. So. This, of course, then leads us to the question of, well, how many rounds do I need? I know that if I do enough uh, rounds of Thorpe, I get a uniform shuffle, but how many do I actually need to converge to this uniform distribution? So for this, we're going to use this technique called couplings. So a uh, coupling of a Markov chain, and I'll give you the technical definition here, and then we'll talk through it a bit. So a coupling of Markov chains with the same transition matrix P is a sequence of paired random variables, X and Y such that if you were to look at just the X part of this pairing, it is a Markov chain with transition matrix P. And likewise, if you were to look at just the Y part of this pairing, it too is a Markov chain with the same transition matrix P. So intuitively, you can think about this as like watching two, two Markov chains running in parallel two Markov chains with the same state space and the same traditional probability of running in parallel. But that doesn't mean that they're doing the same thing. It doesn't mean that, that, you, um, that you are always in the same state. It simply means you have two Markov chains that behave in exactly the same way. So for example, you could think of um, a coin flip Markov chain, really simple thing, right? You could have a, a coupling of two coin flip Markov chains where X, the X sequence is determined just by flipping the coin and the Y sequence is determined by flipping another coin, and then you pair them together. This would be a valid coupling. You have two Markov chains that behave in the same way. This isn't a very interesting coupling because really what you'd like to know, we're trying to figure out what's the long-term behavior of, of this sequence X that I care about, this coin flip sequence, the shuffling sequence. I wanna know what's the long-term behavior of that. 
And I could say something about that if I could somehow compare it to, say, the uniform distribution. So if, if the Y sequence was produced by starting in the stationary distribution for the Markov chain, and the X sequences started with whatever initial distribution you want, then it, it would be cool, and in fact it's true, that you can take any coupling and you could modify it and have it still be a valid coupling so that at some point in time, if at step S, the two random variables take the same value, then they will remain having the same value forevermore. At this point, you say that the two chains, the two subchains X and Y are coupled. I like to think of this as being like, you have two drunks that are stumbling out of a bar. They're taking their own random walks. At some point they bump into each other, which point they're like, hey, and they link up arms. And from then on, they walk together, right? They've coupled. This is a coupling of Markov chains. This is useful because as I just said a moment ago, if, if you're, you're, you can think of the Y chain as being like a reference chain. If it's distributed according to the stationary distribution at the beginning, then it's stationary forever. And so at the moment when these two chains, the one you actually care about, the X chain, this is what's describing your process. When the X chain becomes coupled with the Y chain, that means they're gonna stay, they're going to not only have identical distributions, they're gonna be in the same state from then on. But of course that means then that the X chain that you care about now, it's going to be in the stationary distribution too, because X and Y now have the same values forever. So now you can start to see like why this is gonna be useful for us, because if you know that the Thorpe shuffle has a stationary distribution that's uniform and you wanna know uh, how, how many rounds of Feist or how many rounds of the Thorpe shuffle does it take to get to the uniform distribution? What I'm actually asking is, when do these two things, my reference Y chain, which is started in the uniform distribution and stays there, when does the chain I care about actually line up with that? Because at that point, I know that I've actually got a uniform shuffle or a uniform permutation uh, in my, my maximum balanced Feistel. <clears throat> so that's what we need to do is figure out when, when does that happen? And there's a bunch of beautiful results about coupling. In fact, there's an entire textbook written on this that is actually on the other side of my table here. Um, let's define a couple terms. So the first one, this tau sub X of epsilon, this is the, um, the, the minimum value of T. It's the first time at which if you take P to the T, so remember this is the probability of starting in a position X, ending up at any particular position Y. We're looking here at the statistical distance between the, the X row of P to the T. We're looking at that and comparing it to pi, the stationary distribution for the Markov chain. We're asking what's the first time that if I started in state little x, what's the first time at which the distance between the distribution named by this row in the matrix uh, is epsilon close to the stationary distribution? Is that, is that clear? Okay, I'm gonna assume it is. So that's the first time, if you started from x, that you end up being epsilon close to stationary. If you take the max over all values of X, this is like the worst case starting point. And this is what's referred to as the mixing time or the coupling time of the Markov chain. Because what this is saying is no matter where you started, after this many steps, at most this many steps, tau uh, of epsilon, um, you will have coupled. And the reason we say this is because there's this really nice result, uh, standard result from coupling theory that says, if there exists a capital T, such that for every, uh, every starting of the X chain, little x, and every starting of the Y chain, little y, if there exists a time, capital T, such that given that we started the X chain at little x and the Y chain at little y, the probability that the two chains are not equal, they have not yet coupled. If we have a time T such that this probability is at most epsilon, then it has to be that the coupling time is at most capital T. This isn't a super intuitive result, but it's, it's a fact. If you can find a capital T such that this probability is most epsilon, then you will couple in at most this many steps. So in other words, no matter where the real chain starts, the distribution 
at time step t is epsilon close to stationary. So let me give you an example of this. This is a simple example. It's another kind of shuffle. It's called the random to top shuffle. This is, I think, one of the easiest ones to, to, uh, to kind of exercise this, this uh, uh, machinery of coupling uh, to get some sense for it. So the chain we care about, this X chain, you're shuffling the deck in the following way. You pick a random position V in the deck and you pull the card out and has value C on it and you move it to the top of the deck. This is the random to top shuffle. That's, that's our, our chain. Our reference chain is instead going to be, you find that card C in the deck and you move it to the top. So again, the actual shuffle is you pick a random position, you pull out the card, you look at its value and you put it on the top. Over on a reference chain, what you do is instead you take the deck and you find C in the deck and you move it to the top, okay? This is a valid coupling. These two together is a valid coupling because in particular, the probability that any particular card ends up being the one that gets placed on the top is one over the size of the deck. So these are two Markov chains that have the same transition probabilities. They're just built in slightly different ways. Well, what you observe is that if you were to watch these two decks uh, being shuffled in parallel, that once a card C has been placed on the top of the two decks, it stays in the same place, you know, it'll move as you go on, but it'll remain in the same position in the two decks forevermore. Once it's been moved to the top, it's always going to be in the same place from then on. Well, that implies then that these two decks are actually identical once every card has been moved to the top at least once. But really, this is nothing more than the coupon collector's problem, right? You're picking a random, you've got this collection of distinct coupons you're, pick, you're getting one of them at random in each round. And you can say that you're done when you've gotten every coupon. In other words, when every card has been moved to the top. Moving to the top is getting a coupon. This is just the coupon collector's problem, which means we can roll in results from coupon collectors that tells us that the probability that there exists a card C that has not moved to top in this many number of steps, n log n plus some constant times n number of steps. Coupon collector result tells us that the probability that there exists some card that you haven't yet touched, some coupon that you haven't yet collected, is at most this. And this is just a simple application of, um, uh, what is this, like in indicators plus union bound, right? This is the probability that a particular card has not been touched. And then you have to have that card not be touched for all the steps so far. And that's for one card. And then you're doing it for end cards. So just a, a simple indicator uh, union bound sort of trick here. And if you simplify this, this reduces down to E to the minus C. So that says the probability that there exists a card that hasn't been moved to the top is the most E to the minus C. But that's exactly the same as saying that these two decks that are determined by the X chain and the Y chain are not the same at time T. If there exists a card that hasn't yet been touched, then these two decks are not the same at time T. Well, but if this is, remember, this is what we needed for our, our mixing time result. This is at most epsilon when T is this many number of steps. So if you simplify this, get down to here, this tells you that the random to top shuffle is epsilon close to uniform, which is the stationary distribution for this, uh, for this reference chain here. It's epsilon close to uniform after n log n over epsilon steps. Tom, this is pretty cool, right? Because what we've done here is a step. Yeah. Can I ask a question? Sorry. Um, so if you can sure. just repeat in the definition, um, how is C defined for the second chain? I, I assume it's not a fixed card. Is it defined by the first no. chain? Or? It's, it's, it is, yes. It's defined by the first chain. So the first chain is you pick a position, you look at the card, and then over the other deck what you do is you just find that card and you put it on top. Okay, is this a general property for um, um, couplings that they sort of, the, the definition of one needs to depend on the other? Not, no, not in general. It just for this, that, that's one of the reasons that this is a particularly simple example to show. This is really the, the trick, this is the art of using these coupling arguments, is figuring out how, how do I describe the process uh, by which these two decks are, are changed. 
So no, in general, no, but for this particular, yes. But the reason that these two are not identical is that you may start with different shuffles to begin with then, okay. Precisely, precisely, yeah. In particular, the, the, the reference chain, the Y chain, starts in the stationary distribution, which is uniform. So you've already started with a un uniformly shuffled deck. Okay, thanks. Now the X deck is, it could be in any orientation you start. Thank you. So this is a, a simple example of using the coupling argument to, to figure out how, how long it takes via the random to top shuffle to get within epsilon, not, not like computationally uh, epsilon, but like statistically epsilon uh, distance from the stationary distribution after roughly n log n, where of course you're gonna, you know, the number of steps grows as one over epsilon, right? So if you make this smaller, the number of steps you need gets bigger, which is what you'd expect. I think we're, yeah, we're just a few minutes from, from our, our break, so this is actually good. This will be a good, a good place to stop here just a moment. Uh, before I do that, I, I, <clears throat> so I want to roll back to Thorpe Shuffle. So we've seen an example now of how to use couplings to uh, talk about the mixing time of a particular process you care about. So let's come back up now and think about the Thorpe Shuffle again. And recall what we're trying to do is we're trying to, to, to uh, ask how many rounds of maximally unbalanced FISA do we need to get effectively to within epsilon of, uh, of, a, uni of a uniformly random permutation or in the Thorpe shuffle language, a uniform shuffling of the deck. <clears throat> of course, in the PRP experiment, you get a finite number of queries, Q. This is you know, the number of queries you get to make to your oracle. So in some sense, you don't really care about having the entire deck of cards, which in this case is all the input strings to the uh, unbalanced Feistel. You only care about where Q of them end up. You want it to be the case that for any Q that are picked, that at the end, those Q end up ordered as if they had been random, complete, like as if the whole deck had been randomly shuffled. So if you think of, of, of a non-adaptive PRP attack, so you have to name your Q queries all up front before the Oracle actually uh, becomes available to you. Then again, I was saying a moment ago that, that a query here is the same thing as, as position. So, the way you set up the coupling here is a bit more complicated. And I strongly recommend that you go and have a look at this paper by Morris Frog Wayne Steers because it's, it's really cool. Um, it's the first paper where this this idea of using coupling arguments uh, for um, for block cipher analysis, block cipher design analysis came up. To give you kind of just kind of a flavor here, the, the way that the coupling is uh, set up is you, so your x your x deck uh, is whatever it is initially. And the reference chain, the Y deck, you start up by saying, okay, if, if um, uh, let's see here. So the, 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 the black positions in the Y deck, you, you make it so that I've announced up front what are the queries I'm going to make. So those queries are going to be uh, all zeros, 100, 110, and 111. Those are the queries that my non-adaptive PRP aperture is going to make. So what I do is I make sure that the reference, uh, the reference chain and the actual chain are the same in those positions to start with. And then the, the rest of them I make uniform. And then my transition is going to be, I'm going to use the coin flips uh, to transition each of these decks. And in particular, I'm going to use the same coin flip. So these two decks are, are going to be using the same randomness as they move forward. So that makes sure that they have the same transition probabilities as they go so that they remain a valid coupling. And of course, that means that then, like, if you swap the relative order of two partnered cards in the X chain, you'll also swap the relative order of those two partnered cards in the Y chain. And in particular, that if at time T, if X T and Y T, so the actual enciphering process and this reference enciphering process, if they agree on the position of a card at, at time T, they're going to agree on it, that position, uh, the position of that card forevermore because they have coupled. So what you get after a lot of work in, in this paper is the following. So if I, if I have a non-adaptive attack and my maximally unbalanced bicycle has this many number of rounds, R times two to the N, where N is the number of bits in the block cipher, and R is just some, some arbitrary number of, of rounds that you get to pick. Um, if I have a non-adaptive attack making Q queries, then this is my PRP bound. And this is a lot to look at. 
But the most important thing to note here is that you have this capital N, which is 2 to the N, so like 2 to the whatever, 2 to the 50, 2 to the 60. That's getting raised to the R, whatever that is. Likewise, Q is getting raised to the R, but importantly, 2 to the N is being raised to the R. If you look asymptotically at this, then if you say the number of queries is this, so 2 to the N, or, or capital N, raised to the 1 minus 1 over R. If this is the number of queries you allow, you plug Q into this formula here, you get this, and you notice that this goes to 0 as the size of the block cipher grows. So if you have a sufficiently large N, you get security. This is going to 0 which means you get security for roughly this many number of queries, two to the n raised to this, so almost two to the n, almost the entire domain. You get security against non-adaptive attacks that query almost the entire domain of this block cipher using roughly log capital N number of, of underlying PRF calls, underlying round function calls. Well, log of capital N is little n, right? Because capital N is two to the little n, so log of that is little n. So in O of N, if you will, PRF calls, you get security up to attacks that non-adaptively query almost the entire domain of the block cipher. I point out here that um, you, you, need, you need N rounds of max amounts of feisty anyway in order to touch all the, the N bit positions and in the input. So really this, this number of rounds here, this is basically like saying I'm making two R passes over the entire string. Well, yeah, this is a really nice result, but of course, this is only for non-adaptive attacks. And what we really care about are adaptive attacks. And here we have this really nice result due to Maurer, Petersek, and Runner that says you can actually go from a non-adaptive CPA attack to an adaptive CCA attack by doubling the number of rounds. You have to do it just the right way, but you can do it by just doubling the number of rounds. So you get to take your non-adaptive result, which we got by a coupling argument, and I'll move it up not just as a non-adaptive PRP attack, but now an adaptive SPRP attack. And you get the same, the same bound, just doubling the number of rounds now. So you can get SPRP security. So you look like a random permutation in both directions up against adaptive attacks that query almost the entire domain of the block cipher using something like uh, linear in little n number of rounds. And for me, that's a pretty cool result. All right, so maybe this is a good place to stop. Yeah, seven thirty. No, it's whatever, whatever time it is there. It's the time to stop. <laughs>